Jaya Prabhu Pada, Jaya Prabhu Pada, Prabhu Pada, Jaya Prabhu Pada. जगतगुरु श्रील प्रभु का देखी जगन्नाथ बलदेव सुभद्रा माए की हरे कृष्ण थैंक यू Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you for uh, coming here. It's very nice to see that there's a new center here and uh, some devotees have gathered and all of you are here to encourage. Thank you so much for being part of uh, a small center like this. And uh, how long has this been here? Oh, one month. One month now? Okay. Very nice. So uh, just requesting all of you to continue to come every week and uh, whenever we have programs. It would be very nice and it's very encouraging to have all of you here. Um, I'm, I'm just here to share a few thoughts, some things that I have heard from other devotees, just here to share a few things. Uh, in particular, I thought we could uh, speak about anxiety. Isn't it? Anxiety is something that is a constant these days in, uh, in the lives of practically everybody. We all have different kinds of uh, anxiety and there are so many people who suffer from depression also these days. Depression is a seems like a very common terminology, so much so, so that um, a lot of people use it as some kind of a style statement also these days, you know, to talk about uh, uh, in, in America, they call uh, psychologists as, as a shrink, you know, shrink. They say, I go to a shrink. Uh, and it is said that one out of three people in the U.S. is a patient of a shrink or a psychologist. And just like, you know, have you heard celebrities talking about how um, my clothes are designed by this fashion designer and that fashion designer? My car is from this particular company. So they talk about that, but they also talk about who's their favorite uh, psychologist, who's their favorite shrink. You know, I go to this person, a celebrity shrink. Somebody's got a sort with another. So it's become like that. Uh, unfortunately, however, as much as they try to, uh, you know, stylize these factors, but the reality is that many people are actually going through a very difficult time. And um, uh, mental health issues is something that has been going on for a very long time. But I think in particular, it, uh, it came to the forefront during the COVID period. And everybody started talking about it and it came to the forefront. So then it caught some kind of, uh, you know, attention at that particular point. Anyway, we're not getting into the uh, clinical aspects of uh, depression or anxiety. But in general, um, you know, we could talk about, um, you know, what people are going through today and make a connect to the original psychologist, the original mentor for all of us. And that is Krishna. So, Krish, Shri Krishna, if how many of you have a Bhagavad Gita at home? Okay, very nice. How many of you, uh, now this is another question. Uh, Bhagavad Gita is there at home. How many of you are reading Bhagavad Gita? Uh, there you go. <laughs> okay, very good. <laughs> so, having a Bhagavad Gita and having uh, reading Bhagavad Gita are two different things, right? Uh, it's like you have a washing machine at home, but we don't wash clothes. It's like that, isn't it? So you have a washing machine, then we should, expectation is all of us have washed clothes. That's the sign of having a washing machine, correct? So Bhagavad Gita means then the expectation is that we should also read it regularly. Okay, all right. So um, if we read the Bhagavad Gita and we understand what Krishna is saying, there is, there is so much. Krishna has spoken about everything actually. So there are some, um, some concepts which have become very modern these days, um, modern terminologies. People use a lot of modern terminologies, which in time keep changing. Every, every time I see newer words keep uh, getting introduced. But the concepts are always very old. Any, any concept that actually works is a very old concept. Words may be new, but concepts are very old. And Krishna has spoken about this 5,000 years ago. 
and where did he speak uh, the bhagavad gita the kurukshetra right so krishna could have spoken to arjuna krishna knows arjuna for a very long time um anybody knows how old krishna and arjuna were when bhagavad gita was spoken what was their age they looked very young actually krishna is always very young but uh, anybody knows what was their age by the time the mahabharata war happened yeah right so both krishna and arjuna were above the age of 80 correct so they were they were quite old at that particular point but they looked very very young okay uh, because they did not have junk food those days <laughs> probably right <laughs> so uh, but uh, in any case they were they were very young and uh, arjuna was still there but there were people who were much older than arjuna also isn't it there was one gentleman who was hundreds of years old who's that on the battlefield bhishma pitama right hundreds of years old he was still carrying a, a bow and ready to fight and he was the greatest warrior at that time greater than arjuna also everybody was scared of him right he was undefeated bhishma so like that but krishna could have spoken this he knew arjuna for 80 years he could have selected some nice place like a, in a park next to a river on a nice sofa set somewhere he could have spoken why there on a battlefield you know two armies are there in the middle of the battlefield he has chosen to spoke why because arjuna refused to dharmakshetra because arjuna refused to refuse to fight because it's dharmakshetra correct okay but then it's also a fact that wherever there is krishna that place is dharmakshetra right this is a this is a house it's just a ordinary house until krishna makes an entry here the moment krishna has come here then this also becomes a dharmakshetra right it's a very pure place now so um krishna and arjuna both wanted to show us that this bhagavad gita is for anybody who has anxiety and arjuna was at the peak of his anxiety at that particular point peak of his confusion what am i supposed to do my own family and then um i have you know there are scriptures called as the dharma uh, dharma shastras the dharma shastras talk about how one needs to respect their elders leave alone shooting arrows at them you can't even respond to them harshly even if they speak harshly to you you should not respond in a very harsh manner to your elders um and this is what dharma uh, dharma shastras explain but then here krishna is telling him no you have to shoot arrows at them arjuna has not uttered a single harsh word to bhishma he has grown up uh, on the on the lap of bhishma dev and now he has to shoot arrows so arjuna uh, when we read the bhagavad gita um arjuna is telling krishna that his hands were shaking and his gandiva was slipping from his hand at that at that particular time and he was the brave and the powerful arjuna was not able to hold his bow the famed gandiva the name of his bow was gandiva and his gandiva was slipping from his hand and he was uh, perspiring he was sweating and the first chapter of bhagavad gita it's only arjuna arjuna is speaking and he's asking all his all these questions and he's telling that i don't need any kingdom i don't need all of this i i can just go to the forest i had anyway gone on uh, i was banished i'll go back to the forest i don't need anything let them enjoy this they want the kingdom let them enjoy it i don't want it so krishna at that time he explains the entire bhagavad gita uh, perhaps another day we'll go through the synopsis of bhagavad gita but then um the very uh, coming to the original point that krishna spoke the bhagavad gita because he knew that Uh, and which yuga was the bhagavad gita spoken in dwapar yuga how many yugas do we have four four yugas right so dwapar yuga which is the third yuga and this is a very uh, this chatur yuga is a very unique yuga you see usually what happens is um which is the first yuga krita yuga yeah it's called krita yuga or satya yuga right um which is the second yuga all right which is the third yuga dwapar which is the fourth yuga which is the fifth yuga not that okay trick question okay <laughs> fine so um dwa okay dwi dwa 
Dwapara. Is it supposed to be the second or third? Three. Right? Treta Yuga. Three. Is it supposed to be second or third? So how did that happen? Right? So... Uh, Sorry, I disturbed the execution. We should have not. <laughs> so, just to start it. Yeah. Because I, I had actually, I got late in temple actually. I was supposed to leave temple at 2 o'clock, but I left 2 45. I was some prashad and bath, then I started actually. I will request everybody to be serious. And uh, what Prabhupada has given us, actually there is a song, Prabhupada now with it. So what, what, what would happen? I can tell you from my only experience actually. I had a inclination from a little bit of spiritual life. But I connected to so many, so many Shankar, I met personally uh, that uh, Shankaracharya, that Badina Shankaracharya, he came to our house also. But didn't, uh, I was not able to connect myself to somewhere actually. But we are there, I used to. But later on, I was able to connect one Ram Mantra. In North India, they only give Ram Ram. You have to make the one only Ram. I believe it was recognized from Swami Sukhyananda. Yes, Maji. From Lord Ram itself, and he done some tapasya and theology. My, I have not met, but my father met, who was the take care care of that house where Swami Sitanandi got enlightenment from Lord Ram. But they were not believing, because it was like I can say more of because they were. Uh, background was Arya Samaji or something, but they were living in Ram, Lord Ram actually, and there a lot of books also Lord Ram came and there without Ram no books will be so. And I chant, plainly to me I chanted, I enjoyed lot actually. I forget to have a, I'll have discussion on that issue. That point with the in the group private discussion I think. I remember one day they were after disconnection. Uh -huh. So I called you again also, but yeah. we couldn't connect it. As Prabhu already must be explaining you, and he must be saying that this you this you are only Japa is the most important. And which we are doing this in Mahajapa, Mahamantra. And with Prabhupada gave this is a pure philosophy only. And I can say that from others, Prabhupada never declared himself God. Never made for himself anything. And neither he left for his near single pie for his family. Whatever he made, done for Krishna, and he left for Krishna. So that is the great sacrifice Prabhupada done for us. I don't think in this. I but as I said, I, I am not able to find anybody in my journey of 70 years. Anybody, any I met a lot of uh Mathadi, sannyasis. Even I met uh, Osho's personal secretary also. They stay with it. 50 switches on the room and they dress. Five five lakh rupees dress, send a two lakh rupees. So, but Prabhupada is a very simple man. He, even 
His thoughts were there. There is one past time that he wanted to send a letter to Brindavan Sandhank. So somebody, his disciple was going to Brindavan. He said, okay, Prabhupada, you give me a letter, I am going. I will hand over to bank. He said, if you will go from temple to bank, Riksha fellow will charge you 50 paisa, 75 paisa. If I post today, it will get reach in a bank 25 paisa. So for that much, his was odds that Krishna money should not be wasted single paisa. So that way he built up the scorn for benefit. And he called his con not a temple or marriage. He always called his con as a hospital. And we had to get admitted to his con to get treatment to because we are all sick bodily, mentally. Till now we our sickness is gone. We cannot connect to the Krishna. Then he has called K. Swami the hospital. So get treated. I won't take my time in between the Krishna Katha. Thank you very much. And he always says why we are proper taking trouble. He could have, he was very close to, I can say, Krishna. Because he was doing everything for Krishna only. Why he took trouble to go only for on the word of his Guru plus for humankind? Because he wants to save, as Mahaprabhu said, is our duty, Vaishnava duty, a pardukhi of We can save one soul from this material existence. world. So that will be the most gift we can be given to somebody if we give to somebody Krishna consciousness. If you give five lakh rupees, no gift, is, that is not so important. If you make some devotee and ask him to chant, actually, that is the most important. Thank you very much. Please help our this small center to grow and bring more and more souls. Krishna, you will please Krishna and Prabhupada bring in. Very good. Okay, so quick uh, memory check. What was the last point that I made? Ah, right. right. Yes. So we spoke about why, how Dwapara ideally is supposed to be the second yoga. Right? And Treta is supposed to be the third yoga. Correct? But why is Dwapara the third and Treta the second? It is always actually the second one, second yoga is always Dwapara yoga. Third one is Treta yoga. But only once in a Kalpa. What is a Kalpa? Kalpa, we have the four yugas together are called as one Maha yuga. Okay, the four kalpas, uh, sorry, four yugas together is called as one maha yuga. Can somebody tell me how many maha yugas make one kalpa? One thousand. Okay, so four yugas into one thousand. Okay, makes one kalpa. This one kalpa is Lord Brahma's one day. Only day, not night. Night is another kalpa. Okay. So it is his 12 hours. Okay. His 12 hours is one kalpa. Then he sleeps in the night. When he sleeps, what happens? There is destruction. The entire universe. Okay. There is a partial destruction. Destruction. It's uh, too much of information overload. So I'll not tell you more than that. But there is something called as a partial dissolution and a complete dissolution. So... Partially, the entire universe is destroyed in every one day of Brahma. So during the day, it is uh, creation happens. In the night, it is destroyed. This way, this is one day. One like uh, we have 24 hours. It is that one day of Brahma. Brahma like this lives for how long? 
hundred years. Hundred years. Right? Is one day we can't imagine. And this way he lives for hundred years. This information is very important to know how tiny we are. And in this tiny life, how many plans we make. Correct? I want to do this, I want to do that, and then I will become the CEO and I will become the this and that. I will cheat somebody and take over their company and I will do something and, you know, real estate and all this, then I will, you know, then I'll become the Lord and Master. Many Lords and Masters have come and gone. Alexander the Great and Akbar this and that and so many people have come with so many uh, plans to rule the world. World is still there, right? Those plans have gone. People who made those plans have also gone, isn't it? So anyway, coming back to this exchange of yugas. So in these thousand maha yugas, in Brahma's one day, only one maha yuga, there is this exchange. And whenever this exchange happens, only in this maha yuga, Sri Krishna appears. In all the maha yugas, Krishna does not appear. So in one day of Brahma, Krishna appears only once. All the other incarnations appear. Varaha Deva appears. Narsimha Deva appears. Right? Matsya, Kurma, they all come. But Krishna comes only once in Brahma's day. Correct? And followed by Krishna is Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu who appears just now, 500 years ago. When you consider time like that, 500 years seems very, very close by, isn't it? So uh, it is because Krishna, Sri Krishna, whenever he appears, he gives a very special message on how you can approach him. The other incarnations, they come, they're also wonderful. They're also amazing. And as we proceed, we'll talk about all their pastimes. Um, but uh, Krishna alone is, is spoken of and mentioned as Jagat Guru, right? Why is he Jagat Guru? Because he gives you a pathway of approaching him. And in the Bhagavad Gita, he says, Satatam Kirta Yantomam. He says, always you need to chant. You need to remember me always. Satatam Kirta Yantomam. Not five minutes a day, ten minutes a day. He says, all the time, Satatam Kirta Yantomam. In this way, you will attain me. And then 500 years and later, 4,500 years after Krishna, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu comes. And he tells us, he introduces the whole Mahamantra, the whole Bhakti movement. There's a revival of the Bhakti movement. Uh, if you go historically, they say that the Bhakti movement started about 5,000 years ago. It did not start 5,000 years ago. It was revived 5,000 years ago. Haven't we heard of Narada Muni? From the beginning of time, he's always been chanting all over the universe. So the Bhakti movement has always been there. But you see something very unique in the whole Gauda Desha. Gauda Desha, now the Orissa, Bengal, that whole region is called as Gaudadesha. So there was a whole bhakti movement that came at that particular point. But if you look at, um, say, the southern part of India, if you go to the Tamil Nadu region, you have the Alvars, right? In the Sri Vaishnava community, you have the Alvars who are there. Here in Karnataka, you have the Dasa Sampradaya. You have Purandara Dasaru, Kanaka Dasaru, so many great Acharyas were there. And they were all, uh, you know, Purandaradasa and uh, Kanakadasa, they were all contemporaries of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. They all happened at the same time, right? Um, so it is said that Purandaradasa is an incarnation of Narad Muni himself. Narada himself appeared as Purandara. Anybody knows Kanakadasa is an incarnation of whom? Yamaraj, right? So there is a very famous pastime of, uh, of Kanakadasa and how he appears. Uh, and when he, you know, he was, he was born in a so-called low caste at that particular point. And he was a caretaker of buffaloes, right? Yamraj, what is Yamraj's uh, vehicle? Yeah. <laughs> Buffalo, right? So once, um, because he was from a low community, all the Brahmanas who were there at that time, they said, uh, uh, you know, he's a low caste uh, person. His spiritual master is a very, very great Acharya called Vyasatirtha. So he had uh, he had asked Vyasa Tirtha for Diksha, Diksha Mantra, that you please give me also Harinama, I want to chant Harinama. And Harinama comes from a spiritual master. So Vyasa Tirtha was ready, but there were other people who said that hey, he's, he's coming from a lower caste, what will he chant? Uh, you know, 
he wants to chant krishna krishna instead of krishna krishna he should chant uh, kona 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 in buffalo uh, it means buffalo in kannada right so he should chant kona kona so um, this news went to vyasathirtha vyasathirtha said yes yes you call kanakada say he wants to chant krishna no? so vyasathirtha knew who he was so vyasathirtha told him um, yes kanaka why do you want to chant krishna krishna you chant kona kona enough for you so he says uh, okay if my guru is telling me to chant kona kona i will chant kona kona so he he sat in great devotion in front of his guru he chanted kona 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 and uh, he was referring to a buffalo guess who visited yamaraj buffalo appeared there the big kona gigantic kona appeared right there in the middle of the room and everybody got scared right everybody got scared and they were what is this what is this big buffalo and it's not an ordinary buffalo that you see in the streets so uh, looking at this gigantic buffalo everybody got scared and uh, vyasathirtha alone he was so happy and he laughed and he, because he now knew that everybody knows who he is so at that particular point he revealed that he is yamaraj himself so all these devi devatas uh, great powerful rulers of the of the planet yamaraj is is the ruler he is the great judge there's no greater judge than than him in the material world the final judge we all will meet him at some point so when we meet him he is going to ask us many questions so this past time that i just told you you can remind him i've heard this don't punish me i know every everything about you huh? so um, he also wants us to chant that is why um, you know kanaka he has given us so many prayers he is also so you go to north south east west so many places so many acharyas if you go to maharashtra um, tukaram ji was there right and um, if you go to gujarat narsing mehta is there narsing mehta is the one who chanted um, vaishnava janato tene kahiye you heard that gandhi ji used to sing that right so that was originally sung by um, narsing mehta like this so if you go to any part of india there were so many acharyas who sang so many wonderful uh, past times at that particular point so this is the great movement and if we don't take advantage of it it would be really very unfortunate right it would be very unfortunate so um i thought today we'll share a few um you know few past times about um recently last wednesday we celebrated shri varaha jayanti all of us have heard about varaha deva right varaha so varaha is um one of the prominent in incarnations of narayana or vishnu hmm? so varaha deva he killed one particular demon anybody knows who that is ravana right oh kamsa sorry oh i forgot hiranyaksha or hiranyakashipu hiranyaksha okay and who is uh, hiranyaksha's brother that has to be ravana hiranyakashipu is it okay all right sorry i'm little confused i'm just checking okay all right so hiranyaksha right hiranyaksha now okay uh, next level question anybody knows who's the who are the parents of hiranyaksha and hiranyakashipu diti and kashyapa okay so kashyapa muni and diti okay that is a different uh, maybe some day if we have more time i'll tell you about how they were born and all that but then uh, anyway they had two um, very very powerful sons uh, hiranyaksha and hiranyakashipu hiranyakashipu will tell you more about him after some time when narsimha jayanti comes we'll talk about him okay so today we'll talk about hiranyaksha hiranyaksha very powerful um, very very powerful demon and it is said that his hands used to itch he was so powerful but he was he couldn't find anybody powerful enough to fight so he used to feel you know what is this there is nobody strong enough to fight so he used to enquire of the devatas who's got strength who can i go and fight and everybody used to all the devatas used to get scared it is said about hiranyakashipu leave alone uh, opening his mouth if hiranyakashipu just raises his eyebrows all the devatas used to shake he used to get so scared if he just raises his eyebrow so you can imagine his power was so powerful it's unimaginable right today we you know hiranyakashipu's mentality may be there but uh, you know even demons these days are all uh, husky you know there's no strength they're so weak so um, there is one there is one uh, saying that 
these personalities they were not here on earth they were in some other planets they were lived in uh, higher planets so um, hiranyaksha hiranyakashipu all these demons they were interplanetary wars that were happening in that particular yuga which is in satya yuga later on the next yuga was treta and who is the prominent incarnation at that time of vishnu shri ramachandra when ramachandra came there was a demon called ravana all very famous so interplanetary wars in satya yuga next in treta yuga it became between two countries one demon same planet but different countries then comes dwapara yuga when it was no more two countries it was in the same family kauravas pandavas right it came closer and now in kali yuga not even same family both demons and devatas are inside one person only it is inside us right sometimes we think good things sometimes we think bad things right sometimes i'm thinking like this sometimes i'm thinking like that so sunday should i go to iskon or should i go to netflix should i go to you know so many options are there what should i do correct so then uh, who should win Who, whoever you listen to more that person is going to win right so we should listen to the devata within us because uh, the demon within us will tell us hey, yeah, netflix new movie is just released you can go and watch that right so we should listen to the devata the more we listen to the devata the more the devata becomes powerful within us correct like that so um now in this satya yuga what happened was hiranyaksha with his itchy hands he wanted to find somebody powerful so somebody told him that varuna deva the lord of the oceans right you should he is known to be the most powerful why don't you go and uh, go and meet him and he goes to he said okay so he goes to varuna and he challenges varuna varuna at that time he is a very powerful devata but nobody was as powerful as hiranyaksha at that time so varuna knew that so varuna said okay what do you want he said i'm here to fight you and uh, he was so arrogant uh, hiranyaksha he was carrying a club with him club gada mace so he said actually i just bought this simply for you i can just finish you off with my hands but out of respect i thought i shouldn't disrespect your death so i thought i'll hit you with a club and kill you so what do you prefer my bare hands or the club so um, varuna said uh, i see your arrogance is very high it's so powerful your arrogance is and um, your arrogance is not for me but there is another person who is much more powerful than me in fact i can't even i can't even nobody is able to measure his strength why don't you go meet him if your hands are so itchy go and meet him right so he said oh really there is somebody like that and you are saying he is much more powerful uh, no measure to his strength who is that he says mahavishnu you go and talk to him meet him so where can i find him where can i find him so you can't just find him like that why don't you go and speak to lord brahma then he goes and he challenges all the devatas and he meets lord brahma lord brahma is is in complete anxiety right so in his anxiety he is asking he is praying to the lord that my lord uh, you know we have i have created this whole universe but this rakshasa alone i did not create this universe for him he is dominating it he is ruling it he is he is abusing the devatas he is killing your own devotees my lord where are you when will you come because there is nobody who can defeat him nobody is powerful enough to defeat him and exactly at that time what hiranyaksha had done was that to provoke the devatas he was he was so powerful he had enlarged his body so much that just like a child will hit a ball hiranyaksha he hit planet earth bhumi and planet earth had moved out of its out of her orbit and fell into the ocean now one may ask planet earth fell into the ocean but isn't the ocean on planet earth itself how can earth fall inside the ocean of right so um there is some day maybe we will talk about the entire universe and how this universe functions uh, according to shrimad bhagavatam so there is a garbhodaka ocean okay where uh, have you seen pictures of narayana lying down on an ocean that is called garbhodaka ocean so half of this universe is garbhodaka ocean and narayana is there on that ocean and then from narayana's uh, navel 
comes a Kamala, right? A lotus comes. And from that lotus is born Brahma. That's why one of Brahma's name is Kamala Asana. Okay, because he is there in uh, the Kamala, right? Uh, not the Tamil actor, famous actor, not him. <laughs> Lord Brahma's name, okay? So, uh, Brahma has born. Now, through this entire stem of that Kamala, the whole planetary systems are there. Okay, the upper planetary systems are there. All the Swarga planetary systems are there. Many, many. When we say Swarga, it's not only one planet. There are many, many planetary systems. Okay, and much above all the Swarga planets are Janaloka, Tapoloka, uh, Satyaloka. This is Satyaloka is also known as Brahma Loka, where Lord Brahma, the highest planet is Lord Brahma's planet. Like that, then in the middle, we'll have, we have Bhuloka. Bhuloka is this earth, but earth is not the only Bhuloka. Uh, this Bhu Mandala is there. So there are many other earthly planets around this place. And below this realm are the lower planetary systems. Atala, Sutala, Talatala, Mahatala, like that entire uh, section is there. Hmm? And much below that, uh, then in the uh, right below that is the Naraka planets where Yamaloka is there and all of that. Uh, so when I said that we will meet Yamaraj, all of us have to meet Yamaraj. Good people and bad people, everybody meet him. Okay, because that's that's not a, the place where he stays. Yamapuri is not hell. That is also a very beautiful place. So we'll all go there. Then that's where the account checking happens. Then he decides where we are going to go. Correct? Uh, but you will be able to miss that whole judgment uh, if we are, if we all become devotees of Krishna, then we miss that whole judgment. Then uh, Yamaraj himself will give us a royal ticket and send us to Vaikuntha after we leave. That's a very important thing. And that is our journey. That's the journey of life. Anyway, so um, this is the general idea of the whole planetary system. It's a little more complex than that. So in that Garbhotaka ocean where Mahavishnu is lying down, Half is water. Planet Earth was toppled and she fell from Bhumandala directly inside and went under the water where there is slush. You go under any water, there is slush, no? uh, like mud slush. So she went and she was inside that. And uh, Hiranyaksha found that to be very funny. And uh, Brahma said, I cannot continue with creation like this. If, if Bhumi Devi, this is happening to Bhumi Devi. And just at that particular point, from Lord Brahma's nose from his nostril, Varahadeva, he appears. He comes like a very small, Brahma's nose I'm sure is very big, but uh, he came out of that, correct? So usually ordinary human beings, nothing nice comes out of our nose. Mm -hmm. But Lord Brahma, Vishnu himself will come <laughs> out of his nose. So uh, Lord Varaha, he comes out of his nose and he is so radiant and so beautiful Generally, if you talk about a, a wild boar, we think it's a pig or a boar is a very dirty animal. And if none of us want to go close to it or you know keep any contact with it. And the moment you look at a pig, we would not really look at it for too long. You just look at it, okay, it's a pig. And we just keep walking our way, right? You don't let it approach you uh, and all of that. So, but this Varaha was so beautiful, so nice to look at, that it is said that all the devatas were who were in anxiety, who were worried, Hiranyaksha, for a moment they forgot everything. And they became so happy looking at, looking at the beauty of this Varaha. And Varaha saw all of them, he just gazed at all of them, and he gave them a look of assurance, and he said, I'll be back. And he jumped into the Garbodaka ocean. And he went inside, inside because um, wild boars are known for digging the ground. And that is why he comes in that particular form. And he comes and he picks up Bhumi Devi. He puts his face into that slush and he picks up Bhumi Devi and then he brings her up, right? And sets her afloat uh, into the orbit again. So when, um, by the way, while the rest of the world was thinking that the earth is flat, much, much before that, we knew that Bhu is Gola, correct? Okay. That is why geography was called as Bhu Gola Shastra, correct? Okay. So, now, um, he picks up Bhumi Devi now. Uh, everybody was confused looking at the beauty because it is said that Varaha Deva's tusks made Bhumi Devi look so beautiful. And Bhumi Devi 
made varaha deva look more beautiful so everybody was confused who is more beautiful looking at them both of them looked so beautiful they were a, a, a perfect pair so um uh, they spent some time together and varaha deva very lovingly just like a, a husband would take his loving wife in a car and drop her off very nicely to some place or pick her up very nicely just like that the, the original husband and the or, original wife varaha deva and bhumi devi very lovingly he picks her up and drops her in her orbit and he said that you continue doing your work i'll come back later mm -hmm. so he goes back to the universe and uh, he meets lord brahma and lord brahma says okay now you're here bhumi devi is back but what about this fellow he may go and topple again so he says okay in fact when varaha deva went down to pick up bhumi devi hiranyaksha saw him and he said where are you running i'm here waiting for you and uh, varaha deva he ignored him at that particular point because his priority was to take care of his wife this is a message for all the husbands in this place huh? so priority is wife later on you have to take care of other business okay so he took care of the first priority is to protect his wife and then he came back he said yes you challenge me you have some work i'm here to satisfy that come so then hiranyaksha was very happy that finally i have someone to fight so um, he fights with varaha dev he uh, initially he is throwing punches and varaha dev is dodging him then varaha dev is also punching him but varaha dev is not punching him very hard because varaha dev is enjoying this uh, he is enjoying fighting because originally hiranyakashipu and hiranyaksha were jay and vijaya they also devotees only because even to fight with the lord an ordinary person cannot fight with the lord right so devotees only he gets his devotees only to do that but in this particular point they had forgotten that he is a devotee if someone remembers they will not be able to fight right so by the power of yoga maya his memory was covered and he was fighting with the lord so the lord was enjoying it but um, at this particular point daylight was coming to an end and it was twilight twilight is yeah evening around this time when the sun is going down and uh, darkness is prevailing so it is said in the shastras that uh, asura shakti or ghosts and anything evil they become stronger after sun sets they are weak when the sun is up once the sun goes down when darkness prevails they become stronger so everybody is looking at uh, hiranyaksha already giving a equal fight to varaha dev they were thinking our only hope is is vishnu and why is vishnu not killing him why is he playing with uh, with him and now it is going to become dark and uh, once it becomes dark hiranyaksha will become his strength will become tenfold and this anxiety was there brahma did not did not know how to tell vishnu or varaha dev this and he is an anxiety and uh, shrimad bhagavatam explains that brahma is sweating and he is thinking that why is the lord does the lord not know how do we communicate to the lord that now it is going to become dark and he was going in, in so much of anxiety he is thinking he is thinking he is he is so worried about this he is about to break down and in between the fight varaha dev understands what brahma is thinking and he just looks at him and he gives him the brightest most beautiful smile uh, just to assure him just through his smile don't worry don't worry it's okay i'll manage it varaha dev in particularly want in particular he wanted it to become dark so that hiranyaksha can become 10 times more powerful so that in the future people who support him demons should not say that if varaha had fought with him in the night then uh, you know maybe hiranyaksha would have won so he didn't varaha did not want uh, the future generation today also you'll have some people glorifying ravana okay rama is okay but ravana is our man there are many people who say that people who haven't read ramayana will say such things anyway there would have been people who supported uh, hiranyaksha also so to make sure that uh, all these doubts are cleared varaha dev said i'm playing with him let it be night let his power increase by 10 fold or 1000 fold and right after his power increased he became so much more powerful and uh, hiranyaksha said now i'm unstoppable and he charged at, at uh, varaha dev and varaha dev very easily just like a baby elephant would pick up a a mushroom from the ground he just swole his leg 
on his face, just one mild kick on his jaw, and Hiranyaksha fell flat, dead, instantly. He vomited blood, and he was finished at that moment. Everybody was wondering, so long the Lord was playing with him. And the moment Hiranyaksha became very, very strong, the Lord wanted to show that with his greatest of his strength, and just by my one flick, I can kill him. And looking at this, all the devatas became so, you know, they couldn't believe it that something like this has happened. Hiranyaksha is dead. Hiranyaksha is dead. So uh, the Lord, uh, everybody showered flowers on, uh, on Varahadev at that particular point. And this was a glorious moment for everybody. And Varahadev removed the anxiety of the entire universe and all his devotee devatas at that particular point. But um, somebody else was enraged at that particular point. Who? Hiranyakashipu. For Hiranyakashipu, you'll have to come back in a few months. Then I will tell you. Okay, because Hiranyakashipu has gone to do tapasya right now. Uh, so he's going to take some time. Then he's going to get some boons. So once his tapasya is over, I'll come and tell you what happened to him. But we will continue with Varahadev. How much time do I have? Five and 15 minutes or something? Okay. So I'll give you a little bit of a, an extension of what happened from um, Varahadev's pastime to Dwapar Yuga when Krishna came. Correct? Is there a, a, a connection between Varahadeva and Krishna, Dwapar Yuga? So Varaha and Bhumi Devi, by their union, they had one son. Okay? Anybody knows what is the name of the son? Narakasura, who was also called as Bhaumasura. The son of Bhumi is Bhaumasura. Bhaumasura was so powerful, some of the Shastra, some of the Puranas explain that Varahadev personally even trained Bhaumasura to fight. Imagine being trained by Vishnu himself. They, you, can, you will be undefeated in the world. And your Vishnu's, uh, you know, uh, Creation, Vishnu's son, who can defeat you? There's nobody who can defeat you. That is how pow powerful Bhaumasura was. And he, um, he was so powerful that um, he was protecting all the devatas. He was protecting all the devotees, all the brahmanas, anybody who was pious, Bhaum Bhaumasura was protecting all of them. Uh, but long pastime short, he started associating later on with some other Rakshasas. He became, he made some Rakshasas his friends. And then he became so close to them that his mind got corrupted and he started behaving like them. Now he became the enemy of the Devatas. And the Devatas couldn't do anything because now, you know, Bhaumasura was so powerful and, you know, he's part of Vishnu. How anybody can defeat him? Nobody can defeat him. But he also had the blessings of Bhumi Devi who was the mother. And Bhumi Devi, like any mother, you know, sometimes the son may be bad, but the mother will always look at the good side and just hope that uh, don't do this, don't do that. She'll just, she can only give suggestions. She gave suggestions, but she didn't want him to get killed also. But finally, when the Lord appeared as Sri Krishna in Dwapara Yoga, this um, Bhaumasura, he went to Swarga Loka and he stole some um, earrings and umbrella and all of these items. I mean, these are not big things for him, but he stole this from Indra's mother. The reason he stole it from, stole these items is because these were signs of respect, you know? So when you take something like that in front of Indra, he stole that and he took it away. And Indra was unable to protect his, the dignity of his own mother. So he was so humiliated and he did that to humiliate Indra. He said, I'll take these things in front of you and there's nothing you can do about it. So Indra was feeling shattered and broken from inside. And they had no hope. They didn't know what to do. Then Lord Brahma reminded them, the Lord himself is there as Krishna. Why don't you go and speak to him? So they all approached Sri Krishna. And they told Krishna, please help us. This Bhaumasura is, is, is really, he is humiliating us. He's insulting us. And he's taken our mother's golden umbrella and earrings as a sign of disrespect for all of us. Uh, so can you please help us? So the Lord said, yes, don't worry. I will, I will help you. But before that, Bhumi Devi had approached, personally she had approached Krishna and asked, told Krishna, whatever you do, don't kill, don't kill Bhaumasura. Right? 
he is he is our son so don't kill him krishna did not give his word right he said we'll see sometimes you also do that you don't want to say anything so he said we'll see some day if you agree uh, we'll take it forward but she will never agree but um, it, it's a very unique situation because krishna went along with satyabhama in that particular war and satyabhama she is the um, she is the goddess of fortune she is mahalakshmi herself and mahalakshmi is the moola and from mahalakshmi comes bhumi devi bhumi devi is the amsha of mahalakshmi right so she is the original bhumi devi okay so um, krishna felt she is not going to give permission but the original mahalakshmi satyabhama she will give permission okay rukmini is also mahalakshmi generally we have understanding of only one mahalakshmi in this world uh, but uh, there is sahasra lakshmi in vaikuntha if you go in this material world in this loka we have only one mahalakshmi but in vaikuntha there are sahasra lakshmi many many lakshmis are there so all of them came as queens of the lord so um satyabhama was there and he wanted to take satyabhama herself to see what what is this man doing and looking at all the destruction around the world satyabhama said how can you tolerate this fellow i don't care who he is kill him so krishna krishna now got uh, permission right this is also uh, um, an instruction for the husbands right always take permission from your wife on very important matters right so krishna set that particular example so krishna asked are you sure he said okay sure so then they, they went in their favorite private plane at that particular point which is garuda deva right undefeated garuda deva garuda deva is so powerful it is said that when he flaps his wings you could hear the samaveda because even when he is flapping the wings he was glorifying narayana through the flapping of his wings also is an eternal devotee of the lord so along with uh, garuda and satyabhama and krishna sitting on top of garuda they go to this place where and uh, the fortress that bhavmasura had created was unbelievable at that particular point because uh, his walls were made of big gigantic rocks we've heard of electricity now in some human being who invented electricity but electricity existed even back in the day and shrimad bhagavatam explains that uh, of from the uh, from ether or uh, akasha bhavmasura was able to uh, derive vidyut shakti electricity so he made a wall of electric electric wall then he had uh, walls made of rocks then he had uh, moats moats are like these deep trenches of water and in this water deep trenches there were crocodiles and other dangerous aquatics there not just that there were also asuras that lived under water they were there inside so he had many layers of protection before he could uh, you could enter his palace now this bhomasura had also every time he goes he had a habit because nobody was as powerful as him so not just defeating kings and devatas he would also want to insult them and as a form of insult after defeating them he would take their daughter so he had in this way he had collected 16100 daughters of other brahmanas rishis kings devatas from everywhere the most beautiful daughters he would get all of them and he he kept them in his fort he had imprisoned them there and they were all waiting there thinking that this is the end of our lives and we just have to be here and uh, at that time krishna comes and krishna shatters all these walls and even the vidyut shakti with his famous and most powerful weapon uh, which is you know even in this in this loka none of the devatas can even imagine the strength of that of that weapon and that is shri sudarshana so he releases his sudarshana which cuts through all these walls just like a child could cut their birthday cake through a plastic knife it was like that sudarshana could cut through all these walls destroyed completely and then um, narayana enters and when he enters before he enters he blows his conch what is the name of krishna's conch panchajanya loudly he blows it and when krishna blows his panchajanya the demons their bones start shaking so loud and powerful and when uh, for demons their bones shakes but for devotees they they become more confident when they hear the conch blow 
right? So devotees became devatas, they all became very confident. But these asuras, they became very scared and they were wondering what's going to happen. But there was one asura who lived under water. Very, very powerful. And he was a general of Bahumasura. His name was Mura. Okay. So this Mura had five heads, gigantic personality. And he heard this conch blowing and he was sleeping under water and he woke up and he walked out of the water. And it was just like a mountain is emerging out of water. He was gigantic body. He just walks and he shakes the water out of his body. And he's, he looked at the sky, who's blowing the conch and disturbing me. And then he's, he sees Krishna, he sees Garuda. And he takes a, a trident and he throws it at Garuda. And uh, Garuda doesn't even move because, you know, it doesn't affect him at all. So uh, Garuda looks at him and, uh, you know, he wants to attack him. But then he allows Krishna to do that. That, okay, you know, Krishna wants to kill him, let him kill. So uh, Krishna releases a weapon and instantly in just one shot, uh, Mura dies and um, with a powerful mace and blood comes out of his mouth and the most powerful general of, um, of Bhaumasura is immediately flat and dead. Because he's a killer of Mura, Krishna is also called as Murari. Right? So Krishna Murari, we say, no? So because Ari means the enemy. The enemy of Mura, Murari, hmm? like this. That is why children were named after Krishna. Because every time you call someone by their name, then we remember this particular pastime. In this way, always we can remember the Lord, right? So these days we give so many other stylized names are there. Uh, but then um, those days, these this is how names. But you know, if we have children, we should name them that. Uh, give them Krishna's names. So anyway, so Krishna enters, then. Um, there's a very dramatic thing. A lot of things happen at that particular point. But ultimately, um, Bhaumasura is also killed. And Krishna kills him on the spot. He also dies because he's enraged. He fights. He releases all kinds of weapons. But he is unable to even uh, you know, disturb Krishna even a little bit. I would, I would recommend that you read Srimad Bhagavatam, the Dashama Skanda, where you have this particular pastime. It is really amazing. Anyway, Narakasura dies. And uh, or Bhaumasura and Bhumi Devi herself appears and she returns all the things that he had sto uh, stolen and she returns this to the Devatas and uh, she she just pays her obeisances to the Lord and the Lord gives her an uh, assuring smile that it's okay, you know, don't be attached to your son like that and uh, she says she understands in that way but she was relieved also of her anxiety for years, you know, my son is like this my son is like that, so sometimes uh, it's better not to have a son than have a son who's like this of this particular uh, character. So then um, he was he went away. Krishna takes all these items that for the for Indra's items he goes to Swargaloka. Just imagine how sweet Krishna is that he didn't didn't tell them okay I got your things you can come and take. He said no I will go there I will go there and I'll give it to them and he goes and he gives it to them very respectfully. So, along with Satyabhama, they say, thank you, we are so grateful, you've returned our, our pride to us. You know, we're very grateful, Krishna. Um, anytime, anything, any help you need, you please tell us. Krishna says, okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Then uh, Krishna, on the way back in Swargaloka, once Krishna had taken a Parijata flower and given it to Rukmini. Mm -hmm. So, this time Satyabhama sees and she remembers, you gave one flower. No? So, Krishna, she tells Krishna, I want that whole tree, not one flower. I want the full tree. So uh, Krishna says, okay, another lesson, never say no to your wife, correct? So Krishna says, okay. So he takes, a, he wants to go and take the entire tree. And who stops him? Yeah. Indra. This is how we are. Because we are so convinced that everything belongs to us. Right? You please help me. Sankata Bandare, Venkata Ramana. That's all. Only when I am in difficulty, I will remember Venkata, Krishna. The moment my difficulty is gone, then I will... Uh, you know, challenge the Lord and say, why this, why that? Have you seen in these days when Lord Ram's temple is built, so many people keep asking, why Rama temple? You should build school, hospital. You should build all of that. Why Rama temple, isn't it? Right? Uh, but they will never ask this when a mall is being built, when a cricket stadium is being built. Nobody will ask, why cricket stadium? Why not school? Why not hospital? Why are you building a mall? Only when the temple is being built, suddenly they remember the schools should be built somewhere. Isn't it? 
So anyway, this is uh, this is the nature of. Uh, that's why we said we all have devatas and asuras within us. Sometimes the asuras also speak. Anyway, this is the nature of Indra also to, um, but we should not offend Indra. We should know that all this is to teach us a particular, uh, a particular lesson, that this is the nature of the material world, that we believe that something belongs to us. And if Krishna is asking, we return something to Krishna, we have no gratitude to the Lord. The Lord also knows that. That is why in the, in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says, if you don't have anything else to give me, it's okay. He says, patram pushpam phalam toyam. He says, some patra, some pushpa, some leaves, some flower. Um, if you can't find that toyam, little bit of water, at least that much you can offer. I'm very happy with that. I don't need your food. I have Radharani to cook for me. I have Mahalakshmi who's cooking for me. I don't need you to cook. But if you are cooking something and you offer it to me, I will take it. And he will not even take it. As in he will bless it and he will give it back to us. Right? So, because he knows that if he eats the rice, that uh, then what we'll do? So, we have so many, so much we think, no? So, <laughs> so he says, okay, I will, I'll eat it, but I'll still keep it for you. Okay? Like that. So, uh, by this particular pastime, it's a very long pastime, but you know, I try to uh, minimize it in the interest of time. Um, we're, we're done? <laughs> Fine. So, uh, in this particular way, Krishna uh, shows how we are so ungrateful and there's a little bit of Indra in all of us also. Our behavior is like that. So, speaking of the first point, Krishna uh, or anxiety, we were speaking about anxiety. Anxiety, there is a very modern word that is used these days. A lot of people, influencers, uh, social media influencers use this particular word. It's called manifestation. They said, you should manifest your future. And whatever you don't think you want to be 10 years later, think about it now. And slowly that future will come. You know, you will invite that to you. you know? uh, but it may be a new concept, that uh, new word. But Krishna has spoken about this in the, in the Bhagavad Gita. In the second chapter, Krishna, um, 62nd verse, Krishna says, Dhyayato Vishayan Pumsaha. So he says, Dhyayato. Dhyayato means, this is a very powerful, all of us have this very powerful weapon. Dhyayato. It is translated as contemplation. Whatever you contemplate on, you will achieve that. And it's a fact. Whatever you meditate on, you will achieve that. The Shastra has given explanation, a very beautiful explanation. I'm going to tell you something that even National Geographic Channel, if you watch it, they will not tell you this about tortoise. The tortoise or the turtle. Turtle is the one that goes inside the water, right? Something about the turtle. Turtles, where do they lay their eggs? They lay it on the beach, but they live in the water. So they dig the beach, they lay their eggs there, they cover it, they go inside the water, inside the ocean. Hmm? After she goes inside the ocean, different creatures hatch their eggs differently. Like the hen, by physical touch, she has to sit on top and with the body warmth, she is able to hatch that egg. So different creatures do it differently. Uh, what the turtle does, she thinks of the uh, eggs. She is meditating on the eggs. And she is constantly meditating that my children, my babies are there. Nobody is able to explain this. Once the eggs hatch, there is nobody to guide them. Why is it that the turtle don't, they don't run towards the city? They are running towards the ocean. Right? This is the Lord living in everybody's heart who is telling us what to do. Correct? Whom to recognize. Right? Even children recognize this. Isn't it? Who is ours? Who is somebody else's? They are able to recognize from a very young age. They know when to feel secure, when to feel insecure. They are aware of these things. So the Paramatma is there within the heart. Uh, it's a great science. It's a spiritual science that we should be aware of. So these turtles, they run inside the water. There are many turtles there. But these babies are not confused. In the big ocean, with many turtles, they know how to find their mother. And they go, they find their mother. You know, this happens with cows also. Many people, uh, you may not always see this with uh, the modern Jersey cows. But if you go to our Indian Desi cows, Nati Hasu, right? Our Desi cows, you've seen the calf. There can be a thousand cows. But you leave one calf which is just born. It will go here, there, here, there. But it will find its mother. Right? 
that is why there's a difference between buffalo milk and cow milk. When you drink cow milk, it gives you that intelligence. That's why Shastras explain that we should drink cow milk. Um, anyway, that's a different session. We'll get into the, our Prabhu's here, who's an expert in, uh, in that. So uh, he knows much more than I do. So, uh, <clears throat> so um, Dhyayato, in this way, Shastras give the example of the turtle. And it says that whatever you meditate on, you will achieve that. So, Dhyayato Vishayan Pumsaha. So, Krishna is telling that whatever uh, a person is contemplating, Vishayan, sense gratification. If you contemplate on a certain thing, my neighbor has this particular car, big, luxurious BMW. So, um, he paid 32 lakhs or how much ever, I don't know how much a BMW costs. So he paid this much or somebody has a Ferrari or something. You look at it once, you look at it twice. Then you go and look at the tires. You look at the paint. Wow. How much you paid? Oh. Hmm. So when you keep thinking about it, then you get attached to that. You get attached to this idea that I also want that. Somehow or the other, I want, I want this. So, Krishna explains the whole cycle. And when you decide that I want it, this is your lust. Lust gets generated in the heart. That somehow or the other, I, I need it, I need it, I want it. If it is satisfied, if you somehow get that car, then you say, ah, okay. Then we will move on to the next desire. Right? That desire will feed and something else. But I want that also. I want the house that he has, big house. I want something like that. If that is satisfied, then you think of something else. It's unending. But if it is not satisfied, that lust will turn into anger. But why does not? Why me? Why not me? Right? And then in that anger, I will even say God does not exist. I asked so much. I went to the temple. 108 coconuts I broke. Still this did not happen. Turns into anger. Correct? This anger will lead into illusion. In illusion, we will say whatever we want to. Right? And in the end, Krishna explains... Um, Smriti Vibrama, he says that you're, uh, you'll lose your memory and memory, as in you will, you will forget what is right and what is wrong after that. And after that, Pranashyati, you will be destroyed. Your entire existence will be finished just thinking about this. That is why no matter how rich a person is, can you say that the richest person in this world is extremely happy? Is there anybody, if you go and speak to Mr. Ambani and ask him, are you free of anxiety? Anything wrong? He's, he's very sad that he's not number one in the world. Right? We all feel that. Right now, we feel that if I had one crore, that's all. I will be very happy. But I'm telling you, if you get that one crore, we will want... One crore is good, but I want to also donate to the temple, no? We should give, no? Then two crores Krishna should give me. Then two crores, if he gives, then two... But I put this two crores in FD. Now, I need little more. Right? So we keep, it's unending. It is always, it's always like this. Uh, this is one of the instructions that Vaman Deva, Vaman Deva also told Bali Maharaj. When Bali Maharaj asked him, only three steps you want. I would have given you three words. Vaman Dev says that if you're not happy with three steps, you'll not be happy with the three words also. So that's how the nature of the world is. So it is very important to remember Krishna because Dhyayato Vishayan Pumsan, instead of thinking of the neighbor's car, let us meditate on Krishna. Because whatever we meditate on, we manifest that. And Krishna, we will attract Krishna into our lives, just like the turtle attracts the babies towards itself. When you are thinking about Krishna, you are attracting Vishnu Dutas towards you. You are attracting devotees towards you. Otherwise, whoever, whatever our past is, whatever family we may have been born in, uh, even if you are the son of Vishnu, if you are in the wrong association, you will become a demon. But if you are the son of a demon like Hiranyakashipu, in the association of Narada Muni, you will become a great Vaishnava. That is why Sangha is very important. Who you meet, who you associate with, they will define even modern uh, psychology. They say you are an average of the five people you spend the most amount of time with. Okay, you're the average of the five people you spend the most amount of time with. So whoever you spend the most amount of time with, whoever is there to influence you, you become like them. Your nature becomes like them. So 
Yeah. Yes, satsanga is very important. Sadhu sangha is very important. So we may be imperfect. We may not have uh, any, uh, you know, a lot of nice setting here. You know, whatever is there, we have a very humble setting. Uh, but we have devotees. Devotees are here to share uh, Krishna Katha and talk about Krishna. And actually, we don't need anything else apart from that. Life becomes very comfortable with just listening to Krishna and the pastimes of Krishna. So once again, requesting all of you, that please do continue to come uh, every Sunday. Uh, come, just spend a little time. I know there are so many options the world is offering us. Uh, we can go to a lot of places. But uh, let's let's uh, tell our mind that no, Sunday during this particular time, we need to come here. We want to listen to Krishna, about Krishna, the pastimes of Krishna. Listen to that, refresh ourselves. Then you're ready for, the, ready for battle for the rest of the week. Hmm? Like that. So, uh, but remember, Krishna is not only for Sunday. Krishna is for every day. So Bhagavad Gita, all those who have in your house, please read. And those who don't have, we'll be happy to provide you also with Bhagavad Gita. Please uh, keep a Bhagavad Gita at home and study the Bhagavad Gita. When you read Bhagavad Gita, you will have questions in your mind and then you can ask questions also. So uh, any questions by anybody? No questions? Because you're not reading Bhagavad Gita. Okay. So start reading. You will have a lot of questions. Okay. All right. Great. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Thank you. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Thanks for the wonderful class, Guruji. Let's all chant one time for uh, Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Thank you. It's like Encyclopedia. <laughs> He must be thanking my wife in order that at least she, she, she should have asked.